Uh, we're going to be talking about, again, the AI topic. And the next speaker has actually already spent four years in AI. I know that we just started talking about but The person brings so much of the experience. And he has built the very first AI product in the company that's called Porsche. Um, so the next talk is going to be about AI and UX. And also, we're going to discover and go through the user research and AI case study. So please give the round of applause to Bruno. Yeah, thank you, Lena. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to be, be here. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the impact of AI on product design. So a bit more about me. So my background is in design, business, and engineering, which gives me quite a holistic background on product development. Um, and yeah, I'm a product design lead for human-centered AI projects. And in addition to that, I'm mentoring young designers and startups to help them with design. Today, we'll have three parts. So the first one will be the state of AI UX, uh, where we cover where the hype comes from, what an LLM is, Romina already touched on that tomorrow, uh, this morning, but yeah, I will elaborate a bit more on that. We will learn about limitations and potential of AI in the current state, um, and I will show you some examples of companies who are currently already applying AI in a UX um, environment. Then next up, we have the predictions. So I will talk about human AI collaboration and how we can work together and I will share three predictions um, from the trends that I'm observing and that I derive from that. And then the last part, I have a case study for you where I tell you a bit more about my process for thinking about AI products. Um, I will explain a problem that I've encountered myself and I will yeah, show you an example of how I tackled that and how my vision for such a thing looks like. So, as I said, the first look will be the state of AI UX. And I would like to know who of you has tried ChatGPT. Can we? Okay, that's almost everyone. I expected that. And next question is, who, who uses it in a daily work? Okay, so still quite a lot. That's that's pretty good. All right. So I want to start with like a small story. Um, it was like I guess kind of 20 years ago or something. So I was quite new to computers and. Uh, my uncle was telling me how to use them, and he said, okay, you just need to write a command there, and then the computer executes it. So I was super pumped, opened my Windows Notepad, and back then I was into gaming, so I typed in something like that, and you can imagine my frustration when nothing happened. And I was, like, I was even questioning why my uncle lied to me about the use of a computer. But, however, fast forward 20 years, and we're getting to a state where something like that change completely. So as you know, you can now write commands in computers and they actually do something. So they can generate all kinds of things that we've seen earlier today. So whether that's images, whether that's text, whether that's code, pretty much everything. So that is super exciting. Uh, and I'm happy that my expectations of back then finally comes true now. So AI has been around for decades. There's for decades, scientists were searching for an answer of how we can map human intelligence and bring it to computers. But until recently, that hasn't really reached the public. So it might be some algorithmic um, AI models in Facebook that are somehow accessible to the public, but we are not very much using it. We were rather used by it. So what has changed recently that it now in the public eye, AI is something that everyone can kind of use and at least feels like it's a tool that they can use in the existing workflow. I think the most important thing that changed is the interface. So one reason for that is that, the, or the, the main reason actually is that we use the design pattern that is very common to most internet users. It's a chat interface. So everyone is kind of familiar with how that look, uh, looks and works like. You type something in and you get an answer. And I think that is like the, the most important thing that the threshold has been lowered tremendously and therefore it is now publicly available and people can get a feeling of, of how these tools work like and how they can improve their work. So AI UX is quite a broad field ranging from like personal um, or algorithmic personalization, as I just said. So that's these things that keep you glued to your TikTok feed, for example, because they learn about you and they feed that data back into their systems. 
but it can also be used for generating content. So we will focus on the latter today called generative AI. That is like the fundamental technology behind the to these tools that you all guys are, are using, ChatGPT and MidJourney. There are tons more, but I think you get the point. So, what are LLMs actually? So as I said, Romina briefly touched on that, um, but I still, when I'm talking to people who are not in that space, I still feel a lot of confusion, so I thought I would integrate it here as well. So to break it down, LLMs or large language models are AI algorithms that are used to generate content, so that could be anything from understanding it, summarizing it, generating it, or predicting it. However, here's the challenge. I think LLMs are here to stay, but they currently lack a specific UI to be really beneficial for your workflow. So if you use ChatGP, which most of you had, I think you were in a situation where you were writing some prompts and you're getting an answer, and you were probably copying it to some other platform, whether that's like for communication, if it helps you to draft an email, for example, uh, or like summarizing some user research, there's probably another place where you want to put it, and that creates a lot of inefficiencies, and that is like the, the biggest problem that I'm currently seeing, that ChatGPT is great for like testing AI and really getting to know what it can do, but I think it's not perfectly integrated yet, and that's something that we really need to change in order to get like all these um, efficiencies that we're looking for. So, the potential impact is huge though. There was a McKinsey study that estimates that generative AI will add three trillion dollars to the global economy, and 75% of that will be created in these four areas. So that is customer operations, marketing and sales, software engineering, as well as research and development. So you can already get an understanding for how much AI will impact our work. So that's, it is it's really interesting. And if we zoom in a bit more on the design and research potential, um, I think that is especially interesting because, and we will touch on that later, there will be so much change very soon because it will allow us to gather insights more quicker, analyze them, and therefore our iteration will be faster and quicker and that will be in my opinion, at least a competitive advantage that many companies want to use. So essentially, we will need to rethink how the world works, or more specifically, how it designs. And I've collected some examples of you here. Um, first one is Jamboard by Figma. So um, it is essentially a FigJam plugin that helps you with your whiteboarding sessions. Um, yeah, another one that I would have added here, but I just found out today is that Miro announced something similar, so they will add AI functionalities to their product as well, uh, which is quite interesting. So you can really see it as a co-pilot or like a brainstorming partner, which will add, add up so many possibilities for you, and it will be very exciting to use these tools. Another one that was mentioned already today is Diagram, which was recently acquired by Figma. Uh, I think that is a very strong signal of the direction that Figma will, will go to uh, if we are talking about automation for design. Um, so yeah, we will touch on that later as well. And the third one, Galileo AI, they have a different approach. So where Diagram rather, as of now at least, develops plugins for Figma. Uh, Galileo wants to go the route of natural prompting, so natural language prompting to a whole UI. So you may have seen these demos of where like they are asking to create a dog walking app and then the AI just creates it. So I think as of now it's a demo, but it's showing us the direction of where we're heading. Um, so yeah, that, these are just some few examples, but it's developing so fast that it is really hard to keep up. But yeah, if you ask me this, there's something exciting in, it, in that space, but it, I can also understand that it's, it's a bit terrifying for some. So let's now have, have a look at a few predictions um, that I derived from observing these developments. So I really liked this quote in that context, we make our tools and then our tools make us. I think it perfectly captures the situation that we're currently in with AI. So we are at a point of history where we can decide what our next tools would look like, how much we want to enable them, or which 
kind of part we are ready to give away that we are actually no longer need to do that. So that could be, in the first place, I guess, annoying things like naming layers or like all this documentation that someone has to do, but most people don't really enjoy it. Um, but yeah, I think the main point here is that we can shape it now. We can share or think about our expectations and see how they can be uh, transferred to a product. So when we're talking about human AI collaboration, I see that many people are very scared about it. Many people are afraid if they will get replaced by an AI robot, and we and Kim just touched on that. Um, I think we share a view that it is not the, the case. I think that our roles will change, and not only the, um, the roles of designers, but rather pretty much everyone who works with a computer. So that will be huge. I think we will see huge shifts in the next few years. Um, but as of now, I think it's like a good split, at least in my opinion. So I think as of now, we as humans are still the one who think, and then we have the AI who executes our thought. So Kim just made the examples of prompting, where we are describing mid-journey what we want. And that is the second point here. So we curate what the AI has created, and we help it to refine it. But we're still in a position to make the decision. So it is just another tool if you think about it. And, and humans have been afraid of new tools for pretty much all of our history. If you think about like the rise of technology in general, which already people predicted, okay, we won't be needed anymore. But guess what? We were still needed. Just our jobs shifted. And I think we are just ahead of some big shift as well. But to kind of calm your nerves a bit, I think we're still needed. It just will be some different kind of jobs. And the last point here, where I, AI is very good at rather monotonous tasks, I think it is an exciting outlook for us that we can focus on the rather novel task of our jobs and not these things that you do over and over again but don't really enjoy doing it. Okay, let's have a look at the first prediction now. That goes a bit in the direction what uh, Romina already said this morning. So I think we will see natural language to interface design and front end based on existing design systems and generative AI rather soon. So how can it look like? Pretty much how I described with the dog walking app. So I think the, the underlying assumption here is that we have a design system which is very well maintained and well, very well documented. We would need that. But then what would that enable us to do is that we can actually describe, let's say, a login page, for example, and then the AI will automatically pick the components that are necessary for it to, um, to yeah, become a screen. And if you think about it, many of us still do something similar in a day-to-day -day job, right? So you have your existing design system, and in order to, to create these screens, you assemble components, basically. So I think that will be a rather easy use case. And I think that Figma will play an important role here. So I talked earlier about the acquisition of Diagram who are like experts in that kind of thing. Um, and they recently announced an integration of OpenAI. So um, yeah, I think we will see that rather soon. It might not be perfect yet. I think it will rather arrive as a kind of an assistant, but uh, that's definitely something that's coming for us in the next, I don't really want to commit to a timeline, but uh, let's say in the next years. Okay, second one, natural language to functional code. The promise of no code is finally coming true. So you might have heard of all these no code tools like, like Bubble and all of that stuff or Retool that promise to give everyone the power of a software engineer and the power to kind of build the software that you want to build or like start your startup without being a software engineer. I think it kind of fell short of that expectation in many ways. So. This rather works for rather simple use cases, but I think that will change as well. So OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, already has a system called Codex, which is specifically trained to translate natural language that every one of us in the room can write to functional code. So right now that focuses rather on smaller functions and not whole applications, but I think that will improve very soon as well, and we will see tremendous shifts here as well. And the third one, autonomous AI prepares, conducts, and analyzes user research. 
We will touch on that in the case study, but as of now, I think that user research might be among the UX disciplines that hugely see a strong shift towards AI automation. Because if you think about it, the elements of that are already there. So we can transcribe a call, for example, with AI. We can filter out the words that we don't need, like these ums and ums and all of that stuff. And we can summarize a transcript, right? So I think what is missing now is the workflow to really get that done and do it in one single application without a need to go back and forth with like your research repository and the AI who actually do, does that and the, like a Zoom or G Suite or whatever you're using. Um, but I think that could be a potential that I'm already seeing signs for. So to sum it up, I think that AI will redefine how product development will look like in the future. So that is a very exciting point. I understand that it is terrifying and I kind of feel the same, but I think it is super important to understand the direction of the development, where it's going, so we can be the first one to adapt and see which, which skills we actually need in this new environment and how we can contribute to making these software systems as best as possible. So let's now think about the case study called Redefining Workflows with AI. So we talk quite a lot about the status quo and what the future might hold. And now I'd like to share with you some processes that I use in my work. And I would like to uh, show you a project that I'm working on. So in the last four years, I learned quite a few things about AI projects. And I kind of wanted to boil it down for you in the next two slides. Um, and I think that is a good place to start. So especially in the top left, start with a problem that only AI can solve. So it is super important that you make sure that AI is the only viable alternative for your product. If there is like an, a different one, use it instead because it will save you so much, so much headache because AI products are actually quite complex. So it goes through the second round, the double build measure learn loop, which is quite a long term, but I couldn't think of a better one yet. But what it essentially means, and I mean everyone here is, is familiar with the build, measure, learn loop. You build a prototype or a new feature, then you measure its impact and you iterate. And for AI projects, you have like these two loops intertwined because you have the exact same mechanism for an AI model as well, which leads to the complexity that I just told you about. And next up, especially in these contexts, I think cross-functional teams are super important. It is important to get like different viewpoints on, um, on your product development. And that's why I assigned these four roles. So it doesn't mean that you need four people in your funding team or in your project team, but I am convinced that you need at least these four roles. So you need a business uh, person to kind of uh, get a sense of the viability of the project, engineering and data for the technical feasibility, and the designer for like the human perspective and the desirability. So I found these projects to teams to be very effective if you combine these four skills. This is the AI incubation canvas. It is a framework that I used to kind of map out AI projects. So if we're like in the beginning of a project, um, we like to use that one. So as you can see here, we have 10 cards in three categories that is kind of similar to what a business model canvas is. If some of you guys have worked with that, only adapted for like these AI projects. Um, the colors indicate who can contribute the most in these project setups that I just mentioned. So the yellow ones are rather for designers. I think they are, have a lot to do with like empathy and getting understand of the customer and the user, describe the value proposition and all of that stuff. The red ones are rather for the business people. So they could be like competitor research, getting a sense of the cost and revenue structure. Um, and one important thing here is that it's, it's not set in stone. So the designer can obviously work on the existing alternatives as well. It is a collaboration, but it's just like who's the expert for that topic. And then the last three here, the purple ones, these are for the data and engineering people. The first one or the first decision that you want to make is if you build your own AI model or if you're using existing ones. So that is a huge decision that will kind of map your, your next steps. Second one goes along with the first one is fine tuning. That means if, how can you adapt an AI model to the needs of your project? So how can you yeah, make that more granular and make sure that it fits your use case? 
And the third one, data logistics, it's all about like where do you get your data from? Are there like internal sources that you can use? Do you need to buy that? How does the data pipeline look like? Things like that and filling that out will help you to get like a high level understanding of what you're actually trying to achieve and I found that very valuable. Okay, let's talk about the extra project that I'm currently working on in my free time. So the problem that I've encountered a couple of months ago, I was tasked with doing some research, user research without like a, a dozen participants. Um, and I had to recruit participants, I had to write a research script, say more or less the same thing to everyone, then take notes, we watch the recordings and summarize everything. And there were times where I felt like a robot myself because I was doing these things over and over again. And I thought there has to be a better way of doing that, a more efficient way. So yeah, that's where I had the idea to work on such a problem. And um, here's, here's the vision of how that can look like. So we would actually need uh, sound for that video if you can check that. Talking to users can be tedious. Preparing, scheduling, interviewing, and summarizing take up so much time. There's so much to learn, but you're always short on time and budget. We can do better. Meet UserFlix, your user research co-pilot. We leverage artificial intelligence to ensure you're building what your customers want without the manual work. Our vision is to automate user research. We're enabling product teams to learn faster and cheaper by scalable AI research co-pilots. Head over to userflix.de for early access. So that is the vision. If that is interesting to you and if you would like to contribute to that to like explore edge cases, to explore how we can actually build such a software, what would be important for that, um, yeah, I would be very happy to you if you like scan the QR code or head over to the homepage that um, it was just uh, said. So userflix.de is a domain where you can enter your email and I will get back to you. Um, or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. So we plan to do like a product advisory board where we um, essentially have a community where we match experts and their topic and like foster an exchange on that topic, make sure we're building a good product. And uh, yeah, it would be great if you want to join that. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. And um, yeah, if you have further questions, we can get to that in the lunch break. And thank you so much. <laughs>